first big matchup of Americans and Germans in World War II erupts in North Africa in early 1943. Untested American troops against the seasoned veterans of the Desert Fox, wily German tank commander Erwin Rommel. The Americans take a pounding at first. Then George Patton arrives. And with him, a new unstoppable fighting spirit. General George S. Patton. His bold attacks are legendary. See the war as he saw it and ride along with his hard fighting troops as they battle their way through World War II. On this 360 degree battlefield, Patton's enemies could be anywhere and everywhere. There's nowhere to run when the war is all around. Patton 360, Rommel's last stand. February 20th, 1943. Kasserine Pass in Tunisia. The German 10th Panzer Division is closing in for the slaughter. One mile north, the target? Green American troops in the floor of the pass. American forces have been in North Africa for three months, but this is their first big showdown with the warriors of the Third Reich. Allied leaders have decided that the American troops need more experience before taking on Hitler's main forces in Europe. But since landing in North Africa in November, they've only faced poorly trained French colonial units, not the Germans. Only 2,000 American troops guard the mouth of Kasserine Pass. Backed up by four Sherman tanks, 36 tank destroyers, and 18 artillery pieces. They're facing 8,000 German attackers with 100 tanks and 65 artillery pieces. Until you control those passes, uh, you're not going to be able to push the Germans and Italians either out of Tunisia or force a surrender. William Harper is a 21-year-old member of the 601st Tank Destroyer Battalion. He hails from Dallas, Texas. Came in with their tanks, supported by the infantry. Infantry came right along with them. And they had us outnumbered, outgunned, and everything else. Fellow Texan Lawrence Marcus is a 25-year-old lieutenant. German tanks were coming over the hill, stopping and firing, and shells were popping all around us. Commanding the German attackers is a master of armored warfare, the Desert Fox. Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. Rommel's skill and fierceness are already legendary. In all the actions that he led in North Africa, you can see the same themes of bold, aggressive action, leadership from the front, very much personally involved with the conduct of battle. Rommel's key offensive weapon is the Mark IV Panzer. The Nazi's Mark IV tank is rolling death. Weight, 25 tons. Off-road speed, 12 miles per hour. Thickest armor, three inches. Main gun, 75 millimeters. As the tanks close in, German artillery and rocket launchers pound the American defenses. It got pretty rough. We found out real quick that they were shooting real bullets at you. <laughs> The Americans are on the brink of collapse. The outnumbered Americans could use a tough battlefield commander like George Patton. But he's not in command at Kasserine. He's back in Morocco, planning the upcoming invasion of Sicily. The American in charge is Major General Lloyd Friedendahl, 
He's considered an excellent trainer of soldiers, but he hasn't shown strong battlefield leadership. He really set his force up for failure. Rather than having depth in that defense, he employed his forces on a very broad front, all sort of pushed toward the front. Friedendahl is also nowhere near the front line. He's playing it safe, 60 miles away. Within minutes, the German panzers punch through the thin American defense. As the widely dispersed American soldiers in the valley floor give way, defenders a mile in the rear consider their options. Is it better to stand still and pop off a few rounds and get hit yourself and be out of the picture? Or is it better to retreat and come back and fight another day? When they put the pressure on them up there and came through, everybody hit it back. Rommel's troops push the disheartened Americans back more than 50 miles. It's a catastrophe. In terms of yardage lost, it's the greatest defeat of the American Army in World War II. There's a belief that, my God, can we fight these people? Are we good enough to fight the Germans? 19-year-old Tiford Roebuck of Tampa, Florida, witnesses the aftermath. As far as you could see were American tanks with charred bodies. They were bodies that were not charred, they were, had been pulled out and were naked. The Arabs had taken their clothes off from them. And this upset me emotionally. I, I openly cried. I'd never seen anything like this before. Within a few days, British and American reinforcements slow the German advance. Then, Rommel decides to withdraw his forces back through the pass to shore up his eastern flank. Patton's son-in-law has been captured in the fighting. And after hearing the news, the general writes his wife, Beatrice. The show was very bad, very bad indeed. On March 4th, theater commander Dwight Eisenhower fires General Friedendahl and summons Patton. Patton is an old cavalryman and tank warfare innovator. He is also as aggressive as they come, and the difference between his leadership style and Lloyd Friedendahl's is instantly apparent. How much more opposite can you get from Patton? I mean, he wants to be right up front, on the line, so he can make battle corrections immediately. He's got his thumb right on the pulse. Friedenhall is basically hiding out in a cave. Patton comes to the front lines, meets with soldiers there. He improves mail delivery. He improves their food. He does the small things that are important to a soldier. But Patton also sees that the demoralized troops need a kick in the pants. Military discipline is absent, and it's the backbone of successful armies. He immediately starts handing out fines to soldiers who aren't wearing their leggings, who don't have neckties on when they're supposed to have neckties on, who aren't wearing their helmets. Uh, $15 fines right and left. Lieutenant Lawrence Marcus is among a group of officers approached by Patton one day. General Patton said, every man old enough will shave every day. Officers will wear ties in combat. And then he came up to about a foot in front of my face and said, and anyone wearing a wool knit cap without a steel helmet will be shot. Within 10 days, Patton has Second Corps whipped into shape and on the attack, trying to squeeze Rommel into a deadly vice. The British Eighth Army, led by Bernard Montgomery, is advancing from the southeast. 
attempting to push the Nazis and their Italian allies northward, while Patton moves in from the west. Near Tunis, the Axis bridgehead, a second British force is already pressuring the Axis troops. Patton's 1st Armored Division will push east through McNassi, and the 1st Infantry Division will push southeast through El Guitar. For Patton, action flares at El Guitar Valley in Tunisia first. But he's not the one who makes the first move. March 23rd, 1943. Dozens of tanks and motorized infantry of the German 10th Panzer Division emerge from a pass onto the floor of the valley. William Harper's tank destroyer unit spots them from its position on a hill. I crawled out of M3 to see what was going on. I counted 75 German tanks out in the valley coming towards me. The Germans are trying to spoil the American advance. The Americans are trying to get the advantage, so they want to get moving right away and strike the Germans first. Unfortunately, the Germans get there, hit them early, now they got to react. Rommel is not in command. He's ill and has left Africa. And he's not a well man. He's got big skin boils. He's been in the desert a long time. He's physically exhausted. He's really run down this point, and Hitler orders him back to the fatherland. The German commander remaining in Africa is Hans-Jürgen von Arnim, an officer who's proven himself both in the First World War and on the Russian front in this war. His Italian counterpart in Tunisia is Giovanni Messa. Messa commands Italy's Centauro division. But the Italian fighting spirit so far has not matched the Germans. The German soldier is a professional soldier. Follows his leader's commands, and he's very disciplined. The Italians, on the other hand, the idea of empire to them is kind of hollow now. Mussolini has not led Italy to these, on the great crusades, he's predicted. Their motivation is nothing like the Germans. Patton's men at El Guitar are caught off guard. Lawrence Marcus commands a tank destroyer, and he soon gets word that German dive bombers are on the way to bomb the artillery. I mounted in the front seat of my command half-track, where I had a 50 caliber machine gun, cocked it, got it ready to shoot. Sure enough, in a few minutes, I saw these planes, about 13 of them, coming over in formation. Lieutenant Marcus opens fire. Soon I saw a bomb coming down and could tell from the angle that it was going to land on my right. Patton's men must prove they've learned from the mistakes at Kasserine if they're going to stand a chance at El Guitar. El Guitar Valley, Tunisia. General George S. Patton's 1st Infantry Division is fending off a German tank onslaught. Patton himself is still en route to the battle. The attack was a surprise, and Patton was busy coordinating an armored assault farther north. His northern and southern forces are trying to advance to the east as British forces close in from the south and west, trying to kick the Axis forces out of North Africa. Now, at El Guitar, German Stuka dive bombers are out for blood. They had sirens, and they would come down with their machine guns and drop in their bombs and turn on the sirens. And this was to scare you to death if they didn't kill you with it, with the bombs. 
Lieutenant Lawrence Marcus is hammering away at the Stukas with a 50 caliber machine gun on his M3 Command half-track. 75 yards away, fellow tank destroyer crewman William Harper sees Marcus in action. He was outside and he fired the 50 caliber at the planes as they came in. Then he would switch the gun into a fellow that was inside them, and he would fire at them as they were leaving. Just then, 400 feet overhead, a Stuka drops a bomb. I jumped out of the half-track, and before I hit the ground, the bomb must have gone off. And the fragments went under the half-track and hit me in three places. My left arm, over my heart, and over my kidneys in the back. Miraculously, Marcus survives, but his war is over. Most of the triceps muscle of his upper left arm is blown away. Meanwhile, German panzers keep grinding forward, but they're attacking into dangerous terrain. Ridgelines ring El Guitar Valley on three sides. A road cuts through the center and exits the valley through an opening at the east end. The American line is anchored here with infantry on the ridge and artillery and tank destroyers below. Additional infantry troops line the ridges on the north and south edges of the valley. The Americans will be able to fire on the Germans from three sides. On the other hand, there are no American tanks present to face them. Patton has ordered his tanks to McNassie, farther north. Though Patton is still en route, two capable U.S. generals are here. Terry Allen, the 1st Division commander, and his assistant, Ted Roosevelt Jr., son of the former president. Roosevelt is older and small in stature, but he rubs elbows with the troops, and they admire him. As the soldiers were getting into position early that morning, I saw General Teddy Roosevelt marching alongside the foot soldiers. He had a carbine slung over his shoulder, and he gave heart. I was proud of him. Above the valley floor, Roosevelt points out targets with the cane he uses for his arthritis while the battle rages on. The type of tank destroyer blasting away for the 601st is the 75mm gun motor carriage M3. The M3 is a half-track it has half-inch armor plating, and with its 75-millimeter main gun, can make fast work of most enemy vehicles. We knock out a tank, and the Germans would get out, and they would take their mounted machine gun and set it up and sit there and shoot at you. They were good soldiers. They didn't give up very easily. Today, knocking out dozens of tanks would take a fraction of the time. We have smart munitions that will actually explode over tank formations and destroy entire tank fleets, uh, destroy platoons and companies of tanks with one or two shells. You have a shell that explodes over the enemy, and these submunitions will then seek out the enemy and destroy those tanks individually. But in 1943, the 601st has no choice but to keep banging away with conventional, unguided rounds. A mile and a half in front of the 601st, part of the 18th Infantry Regiment is on a ridge line to the north. The soldiers slept on the ridge overnight. At night, the temperature would get extremely low. And so men were sleeping out in the middle of what is effectively a desert, a very rocky, hilly environment sand with all of the nasty critters that live in that kind of environment. Now with little sleep, the 18th soon gets its own taste of Nazi ferocity. 
20-year-old Walt Ehlers was part of the initial torch landings five months ago. Now he's with the 18th on the ridge. We were put up on this hill to protect the flank so that they wouldn't come through and get behind our artillery. Half-tracks full of German foot soldiers begin breaking away from the tank column and veer north toward the American troops on the ridge. We're, we're back of rocks on this hill. We, we had a pretty good defensive position, but uh, and when they were attacking up the hill, they were coming right up to us, practically. And half-tracks come up as far as they could, and then they drop them all. A forward observer from the artillery battalions is with Ehlers and his comrades on the ridge. And he called in the uh, ordnance for the artillery to fire on these half-tracks that are coming up in mass to our hill. But the forward observer makes a tragic mistake. He got it in reverse order, and they, they fired on us instead of on the Germans. Well, that was scary. That, that was scary. <laughs> that was the hardest artillery I ever felt. The Germans' artillery was bad enough, but ours was even more explosive. Radio operators scream for a ceasefire, while a round explodes so close to Ehlers, it tosses him into the air. Concussion was so bad, it actually made my ears bleed. Back down in the valley, another disaster is nearing as the German tanks close in. Ted Roosevelt, on the ridge above, keeps his cool and radios for more tank destroyers. But they're six miles in the rear. There's a substantial force, maybe 40 German tanks, threatening to flank and get behind the American position. By the time the reserves arrive from six miles away, it may be too late. Luckily, A Company of the 601st Tank Destroyer Battalion opens fire from the rear of the valley as the Germans close in. They blunt the German attack. Then the tank destroyer reinforcements called for earlier by Ted Roosevelt arrive. Six, 37 tanks are destroyed very quickly in that battle because of the ability to really attack the enemy with fires from many different angles. The surviving panzers withdraw, but they soon regroup. And German foot soldiers are still attacking U.S. infantry troops in the most forward hilltop positions. A second punishing tank charge is coming any moment, one that might finally shatter the American line. March 23rd, 1943, 4.15 p.m., El Guitar Valley, Tunisia. Day one of the Battle of El Guitar. When the Germans launched their spoiling attack this morning, Major General George S. Patton was north, coordinating an armored push through McNassey. But now he's arrived at El Guitar. Patton is atop Hill 336 with Generals Ted Roosevelt and Terry Allen. When the Germans punch into the valley for a second time today. As Patton arrives at this scene, it's got to be glorious for him. Here's a battle right before his eyes. His men are in action. He's been training them. He's been whipping them into shape. And now he gets to see them in action and see what they can really do. A mile and a half ahead of the German tanks, American artillery at the base of Patton's Hill lets them have it. They had these uh, 155 firing point blank at the tanks. They didn't have to shoot over or anything. <laughs> they just they had to shoot straight at them. The Long Tom, the nickname for the M1 155 millimeter gun, fires a six inch round up to 14 and a half miles. A behemoth weighing 15 tons with a 23-foot barrel, it requires 14 men to serve it efficiently. The artillery 
rounds are fused to explode over the tops of the enemy's heads. There are vivid descriptions of the bursting artillery. You see these black bursts that look like swarms of bees and the uh, infantrymen uh, being knocked down like bowling pins. Watching the carnage from atop Hill 336, General Patton is moved. Patton actually laments the fact that it was a waste of really good German infantry, but it was a masterful defensive battle. Today, with the much greater ranges of modern weapons, viewing a battle in this fashion would be impossible. Patton can no longer stand up on the hill today and look through his binoculars and see the whole battlefield. Today, he has to have a council where he's looking at a series of aerial views, which are provided by satellites or by aircraft, that are giving him a much bigger view of the battle space. But in the smaller battle space at El Qatar, Patton watches the German attack stall. Finally, the German 10th Armored Division, which is severely reduced, is simply spent and unable to break through. They retreat. This threat to the entire American position has been repelled. It made the 1st Division all very proud of themselves because they whipped the Panzer Division. Patton is also proud of his men. They have beaten off a Panzer Division with infantry and artillery alone. It was well needed after the disaster at Kasserine Pass, and it was a victory for Pat. 40 miles northeast of El Guitar Valley, at the tiny village of McNassey, the 300 tanks and 20,000 soldiers of Patton's 1st Armored Division are bottled up at the mouth of a mountain pass. The 1st Armored Commander, Orlando Ward, is to take McNassey and then take the pass, but he lacks Patton's aggressiveness. He gets to McNassey, sees just a few miles to the east this ridge line which at this point is held by a handful of Italian troops and does not take the initiative to then take the pass. Instead, Ward waits to gather his forces. The delay allows a small German unit to reinforce the pass with eight Tiger tanks, 350 soldiers, and powerful 88 millimeter guns. The small force is in there like the stopper in a bottle, and they repel the American attack. Soon, a larger German force arrives to reinforce the pass, and it's a standoff. When Patton arrives here and sees this commander is stalled and lost the high ground, he's completely frustrated. He's a take the fight to the enemy kind of guy. When you have the opportunity, he wants you to act and act fast. 20-year-old Tiford Roebuck is at McNassie with the 62nd Armored Field Artillery. If you command the high ground where you can see the enemy, you can bring your artillery fire from anywhere. But if you don't have the high ground, you're at a disadvantage. On March 28th, Roebuck's battalion digs in near an olive orchard a mile south of McNassie their guns begin firing in support of American assaults to take the high ground. But their stationary position makes them vulnerable to return fire from the Germans. At noon, a German 88 millimeter shell lands off in the distance. But Roebuck knows the next round is likely to be closer. That's what the Germans were doing. They were adjusting. Well, they adjusted it on headquarters battery. And then when he got that is when they rained it down on. This is the first day we had ever received any fire, our first day of combat. Roebuck is with headquarters battery as a radio man. I had a half track and a radio to maintain. I was keeping contact with core headquarters. And I couldn't spend all my time in that foxhole. 
Every time one would hit, you would hear them cry out medics. You knew that someone was hit. And they ranged some 2,000 rounds on us. And it was frightening. You just knew any minute you were, you were going to die. The 62nd will endure the shelling for 12 days. With the stalemate at McNassie wearing on, Allied strategy shifts. Patton fires Orlando Ward and orders 100 of 1st Armored Division's tanks south to El Guitar. If they can't get through in the north, Patton will smash through the Nazi line in the south. The pressure's on for Patton to prove he can lead a successful attack. March 30th, 1943, El Guitar Valley, Tunisia. Patton's forces have thrown back the 10th Panzer Division in a spectacular defensive victory. But his follow-up push at McNassie has hit a wall. He needs to break through somewhere so he can pressure the Germans facing the British at Meredith. But the hills overlooking the road to the fortified Meredith line are held by Germans and Italians with plenty of artillery. Second Corps runs up against German defenses, pillboxes, trenches. Germans were excellent at coordinating their fire. Now, Patton has ordered 100 tanks of the 1st Armored Division south from McNassi to try to bash their way through the Nazi line near El Guitar. He's put the tanks and some field artillery units under the command of Colonel Clarence Benson. This is an armored officer Patton knew before World War II, has a lot of faith in him. Patton knows Benson is aggressive, but the general isn't discounting the German artillery. He confides to his diary, Benson may not get through. The worst danger is the hole may close behind him. I feel confident that with God's help, it will work. Colonel Benson's force hits trouble right out of the box. The task force takes off, uh, hits a number of minefields, slows down almost to a crawl. But General Patton must prove he can lead a successful attack. And he isn't about to let a few landmines steal his momentum. Patton, in his command car, drives out in front of the task force and leads it for over two miles before Patton pulls over to the side and lets it pass. Very dangerous because the entire Patton legend could have ended that day had there been enough mines on that road. He realizes he did a pretty stupid thing, but felt that his leadership was needed in that situation. But Benson's tanks soon hit more mines. Then, a mile ahead of the tanks, Flak 37 German 88 millimeter guns open up from the hilltops. The versatile Flak 37 88 millimeter gun is one of the best Nazi weapons of the war. It fires up to 20 rounds per minute, and with a muzzle velocity of 2,600 feet per second, the dreaded 88 can penetrate six inches of armor at over a mile. Artilleryman Hobart Moline is a 20-year-old from Malacca, Minnesota. The 88 was a, like a rifle. It shot straight lines. It, it, many a round went over our head that we could hear. 88 was real sharp crap, it, it, where the howitzer had more of a boom to it, but the 88 was like a shotgun going off in your ear. It really it, it had a crack to it. With the German 88s wreaking havoc, field guns of the 65th Armored Field Artillery waste no time hitting back. 20-year-old Minnesotan Wallace Ekdahl sees his commander spring into action. He put out a map of the area here so he could uh, get the coordinates where we were and uh, he guessed where the guns were. And then he fired a smoke shell to see how close he was to the gun. And then he raised up the altitude. And then he dropped down. And then he finally hit him.
But another threat appears for Patton's troops. Aircraft was our big problem. The Germans dominated the air. I was standing by my half track, and I heard a lot of hollering. They said, here comes the bombers. I just uh, heard the bombs come, the ground shaking. Uh, I went in stomach first. Except for a coating of dirt, Wallace Ekdahl is unscathed. But others haven't been as fortunate. Two of my buddies, they were standing by their half track, and they got a pile of shrapnel. And our motorcycle person got hit real bad. They took him to the hospital, and he died there. And, uh, so that was a rough day for uh, our headquarters battery. With both the Benson Force in the south and the 1st Armored Division in the north at McNassie unable to advance, General Patton is angry and frustrated. He rants in his diary, we're stuck everywhere. You know, Patton's an old cavalry guy. Old cavalry guys just love to get their horses out in the open field, in this case, they're the tanks, and take the fight to the enemies. But he's just frustrated because he, he just can't get the horses out of the stable. Then, on April 6th, Patton and his commanders sense a change. Overnight, the enemy defenses have softened. Southeast at Merith, the British have finally broken the Nazi line, and the enemy is withdrawing. They moved very slowly and destroyed most all of their equipment. There wasn't any route to it. They did it in an orderly way. They were well trained. The Germans pull back to Tunis in the north, the bridgehead to Sicily. The Allies will soon drive north in pursuit, but as they regroup their forces, some GIs get a short but welcome break. We first went to the Mediterranean because I remember we pulled off our clothes and took a bath. We had not had a bath in so long till we, we smelled awful, but I get we all smell the same. But the struggle for North Africa is far from over and a hill outside the northern city of Bizerk will soon host another murderous brawl for Patton's fighting men. April 1943. Following the stiff fighting at El Guitar and the breakthrough of Montgomery's 8th Army at Maris, Enemy troops retreat to the bridgehead in the north. The Germans and Italians dig a final defensive line, encompassing the coastal cities of Tunis and Bizerte. The Allies press in for the kill. An overwhelming Allied force rings this uh, bridgehead. The Americans in the north, the British in the south, and the squeezing begins. But for this final push, George Patton is not commanding the Americans. Ike has recalled him to Morocco to continue planning the coming invasion of Sicily. Patton must have been very conflicted by this. You know, he's a warrior. He wants to get out there and lead his men. He wants to fight the enemy. But on the other hand, what commander doesn't want to get to plan a huge invasion? Although Patton wasn't able to lead a crushing armored advance across Tunisia as he'd hoped, he did transform ragtag groups of soldiers into professional fighting units, and his boss has noticed. On April 14th, Ike writes to Patton, I hope that you personally will accept my sincere congratulations upon the outstanding example of leadership you have given us all. For the Americans remaining in Tunisia, the key objective for their final push in the north is the port of Bazert. The chief obstacle between the GIs and Bizerte is Hill 609. It's a pretty imposing hill, 609 meaning the height of meters. It has a chalky fortress at the top. The topography is such so that there's a wall that you have to climb to get to the very top. The Germans have had quite some time to prepare. 
On top of the hill, German artillerymen have clear fields of fire and unobstructed views of much of the region. Trying to knock an entrenched enemy off the top of a hill that's well dug in, it's probably the worst fight you can get into. But what do you do? You can't give up the high ground. So you scratch, you claw, you get up that hill as any way you can and kick that other guy off that hill. Californian Andrew Jacobson is a 19-year-old rifleman in the 1st Division. They had these, uh, these ADAs jacked up to where they were firing right down the hill, see? And our regiment, it was quite an ordeal trying to get up that hill. Carl Peterson, also a California native, is a 20-year-old mortar man. Wherever there was a machine gun or something that was pinning the guys down, well, then we were assigned the problem of knocking that machine gun nest out. The fight for Hill 609 is incredibly vicious. They beat the hell out of us on that hill. One rifle platoon, nearly all of the platoon was killed right there on that hill, trying to take it. And we lost a lot of people in our company. I would say we probably lost a third of our company right there. The fight for 609 goes on for several days. The Germans don't want to give it up. And uh, then the suggestion is made, contrary to all common sense and doctrine, to use uh, tanks against this rather steep, fortified position. And so Sherman tanks worked their way up very closely. Uh, some of them hit mines and are disabled, but it unhinges the German defense sufficiently to allow the infantry to swarm around the hill. On the evening of April 29th, after a week of fighting, Americans penetrate the Nazi defenses. After some brutal hand-to-hand, -hand, GIs finally take charge of the hill by morning. It's the beginning of the end for Axis defenses in the area. It's really one of the linchpin of the German defensive line. Bizert falls very quickly thereafter. Tunisia officially falls to the Allies on May 9, 1943. Over the next few days, several thousand of the enemy still managed to escape to Italy. But on May 13th, the remaining Axis troops in North Africa, including top German general Hans-Jürgen von Arnhem, become prisoners of war. You have the remarkable spectacle of 250,000 Axis prisoners moving down the road toward prison cages. It is a catastrophe of the first order for the Third Reich. For the Allies, the cost of ridding North Africa of enemy forces has been 70,000 casualties. But for the once green American forces, North Africa has been a much needed crucible, a trial by fire for battlefield leadership and tactics. You're finding out who can do it and who can't do it, who's competent, who's not competent. We're talking about leadership at all levels, from platoon leader up through corps commander, army commander. The hard-won victories have given American troops belief in themselves. In North Africa, the American soldier finds out that he can face and best the German soldier. The American equipment is not to the same caliber of the Germans, but they now have experienced what the Germans have and how to deal with it. American ingenuity, thinking on the ground, the more open give and take of the American army where the soldiers are allowed to figure out their problems and solve them is better than the German sheer discipline. Also, Patton has proven he can lead large forces successfully on the battlefield. It's confidence and vital experience U.S. forces will soon need as they follow the American Lion, Lieutenant General George S. Patton, into the brutal kill zones of Sicily.